Welcome everybody, good morning. Today our Judiciary Committee considers an important and timely topic, um, First Amendment on college campuses. Uh, Senator Feinstein and I will give opening statements and uh, we will also have opening statements from the Chairman and Ranking Member of the Constitution Subcommittee, that's Senator Cruz and Senator Blumenthal. Uh, higher education rests on the free flow of ideas. Education requires that positions be held tentatively, tested by opposing arguments that are rationally considered and evaluated. All colleges, therefore, must protect free speech. Public institutions must adhere to the various guarantees of our First Amendment. Too often, all of these fundamental principles have been under assault. Even worse, some people who have exercised their First Amendment rights have themselves been assaulted. As a result, those who would curtail free speech have been emboldened, and those who disagree with the prevailing orthodoxy have been censored or chilled from speaking freely. There is no point in having a student body on campus if competing ideas are not exchanged and analyzed and respected by each other. At Kellogg Community College, administrators required prior approval for speech in public forums, a twofold violation of the First Amendment. Amazingly, students there were arrested for distributing copies of the U.S. Constitution. Their lawsuit against the college and against its administrators in their personal capacity is pending. Many students erroneously think that speech that they consider hateful is violent. Yet some students engage in acts of violence against speech and universities have failed to prevent or adequately punish that violence. On the University of California, Berkeley, two invited speakers were prevented from speaking due to mob violence and other projected safety concerns that the university failed to control. That university should be reminded of a passage in one of the Supreme Court's most important First Amendment rulings, quote, if there is any fixed star in our constitutional constellation, it is that no official, higher petty, can prescribe what shall be orthodox in politics, end of quote. A lawsuit has been brought that alleges that Berkeley has systemically and intentionally suppressed speech protected by First Amendment because its viewpoint differs from that of university administrators. At Middleburg College, the eminent scholar Dr. Charles Murray was at first shouted down from speaking. Then when the event was moved, students pulled the fire alarm to prevent him from speaking. It was not Dr. Murray, but the students who eventually, essentially 
falsely yelled fire in a crowded theater. The Middlebury professor who administered, who moderated the uh, debate was physically assaulted and has yet to fully recover from her serious injury, injuries. It was not a mere handful of students, but a mob who engaged in such appalling conduct at an institution theoretically devoted to rationality and intellectualism. Not including those who were not captured on video, the college disciplined more than 70 students, but none, none was expelled or even suspended. As a practical matter, most students receive no more serious punishment than the double secret probation immortalized in a film. As Dr. Murray noted, such weak punishment will not deter any future student's disruption. The First Amendment is very clear. The Supreme Court has decided that offensive speech is protected, that speech cannot be restricted based on viewpoint, that public forums must be places where free speech rights can be exercised, and that prior restraint on speeches are highly disfavored. Otherwise, any speech that anyone found offensive could be suppressed. Little free speech would survive. As Justice Holmes said, quote, if there is any principle of the Constitution that more imperatively calls for attachment than any other, it is the principle of free thought. Not free thought for those who agree with us, but freedom for the thought that we hate, end of quote. But on too many campuses today, free speech appears to be sacrificed at the altar of political correctness. Many administrators believe that students should be shielded from hate speech, whatever that is, as an exception to the First Amendment. Unfortunately, this censorship is now different from any other examples in history when speech that authorities deem to be heretical has been suppressed based upon its content. Even more unfortunate, the anti-constitutional attitude is so pervasive that students are being socialized and possibly indoctrinated into favoring censorship at odds with our First Amendment. A recent Gallup poll found that students by 69 to 31 margin believe that it is desirable to restrict the use of slurs and other language intentionally offensive to certain groups. And by a 72 to 27 margin, they favored restricting expression of political views that are upsetting or offensive to certain views, groups. Uh, college students vote. Not only academia, but our democracy depends on the ability to try to advocate, to inform, or to change minds. When universities suppress speech, they not only damage freedom today, they establish and push norms harmful to democracy going forward. These restrictions may cause and exacerbate the political polarization that is so widely lamented in our society. Whatever the nature of the speech being suppressed, we all ought to be concerned, and I am. However, prominent liberal university administrators admit that the vast amounts of disfavored speech is on the conservative side of the spectrum. Harvard President Drew Faust, a uh, recent commencement address, which I will put in the record, note the lack of conservative ideas on campuses. Uh, and as former Stanford Provost John Etchemendy has observed, quote, there is a growing intolerance at universities, a political one-sidedness that is the antithesis of what universities should stand for, end of quote. And he fears that university administrators will take the easy route of giving in to students' pressure to restrict debate. And I ask consent to include his excellent remarks on the record as well. 
Dr. Etcha many fears are being realized. In a recent interview, the president of Northwestern University undercut the apparent lip service that he paid to the First Amendment. Rather than making students confront the speech that makes them uncomfortable, he advocated making students feel comfortable by ensuring a safe space where they will not hear it. Even worse, when asked whether he would be comfortable where the speaker shouted uh, down in Middlebury and Berkeley to speak at Northwestern, he replied that he would permit their appearances, quote unquote, on a case by case basis. No, the First Amendment does not permit arbitrary prior restraint on speech by university administrators on a case-by-case -case basis. That is an open invitation to discriminate based on viewpoint. That is where too many colleges are right now. A reality, great universities would welcome uh, numerous speakers whose positions made the president of the university and many others uncomfortable, on campus uncomfortable. Some may advocate legislation in this area. Theoretically, private colleges that accept federal funds could be subject to individual private lawsuits when free speech rights uh, occur or are, uh, don't occur, including religious free speech if, that, if those are all violated. Some may even suggest an analog to Section 1933. Under that approach, officials at private universities that accept federal funds would be subject to individual rights of action for damages if they violate free speech or fail to train university officials and campus police to adhere to the First Amendment. <clears throat> Fortunately, not all schools adopt the censorship approach. The University of Chicago has adopted a policy that some other universities have followed, which I will put in the record. This policy prohibits the university from suppressing speech that even most people on campus would find offensive or immoral. It calls for counter speech rather than suppression of people who disagree with speech. And while protecting protest, it expressly prohibits, quote, obstructing or otherwise interfering with the freedom of others to express views that they reject or even loathe, end of quote. Finally, it commits the university to actively, quote, protect that freedom when others attempt to restrict it, end of quote. We have a distinguished panel of guests that I welcome, Senator Feinstein. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm going to put my remarks in the record, and I am just going to make a few reflections on some of your comments. I agree with some of what you said. I disagree with others. Um, I, let, let's take a look at the First Amendment. The First Amendment says that Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech, or of the press, or of the right of people peaceably, peaceably to assemble, and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. The fact of the matter is, there are certain occasions on which individuals assemble not to act peaceably, but to act as destructively as they possibly can. And uh, I know a little bit about the University of California, and you cited Berkeley. The president of that university is known to all of us. She was a governor. She headed a 250,000 um, staff Homeland Security Department here. She is tough. She is strong. She is fair. She is able. And the question comes that when you have a set group of people that come to create a disturbance, and some of them even wearing masks or wearing certain clothing, what do you do? And big university police departments, it's been my experience, don't always have the equipment, uh, meaning mental and training equipment, to be able to seek it out, to handle it, to isolate it. So you run the risk 
of substantial harm. And that was what judgment the university made in the one situation recently, that it would become a drawing card for groups that range from anarchists to just very um, unsavory people to be violent. That is really a horse of another color. Um, I was mayor during a Democratic convention in 1984, and I can tell you there was a lot of fear at that time about what might happen at that convention. So we took a lot of, made a lot of plans uh, to be able to handle it, got extra help, and we did handle it, and there was no violence, and it was a good convention. And maybe universities should be steeped in and have the ability financially to really develop the kind of intelligence you need and the kind of policing that you need at some of these events. Um, I mean, I went to a smaller private university. There was never a problem. But you have big universities, and one of the largest is the University of California with 10 campuses, over 250,000 students. Um, so there are instances of problems from time to time. But I think our efforts would be much better uh, finding methodologies to handle those incidents. I know of no effort. At, the, at Berkeley uh, of the University of California to stifle student speech, none. And if there is a specific e effort, I would certainly appreciate it if people brought that to my attention. But I do believe that the university has a right to protect its students uh, from demonstra demonstrations once they become acts of violence. And I hope today that there will be some discussion of when does speech become violent and what do you do to stop that violence. Because we all want freedom of speech. I don't want anything different than you want in that regard. But maybe I live in a different world having been a mayor at a tumultuous time, having gone through assassinations and understanding what happens in big dissent. And so, you know, my state isn't your state, but the volume here can be very large. So I just wanted to make those comments and say that it's not a simple matter when demonstrations uh, become violent. Senator Cruz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you for holding this very important hearing. Uh, free speech matters. Diversity matters. Diversity of people's backgrounds, but also diversity of thought, diversity of ideas. Universities are meant to be a challenging environment for young people to encounter ideas they've never seen, they've never imagined, and that they might passionately disagree with. If universities become homogenizing institutions, that are focused on inculcating and indoctrinating rather than challenging, we will lose what makes universities great. The First Amendment is not about opinions you agree with. It's not about opinions that are right and reasonable. The First Amendment is about opinions that you passionately disagree with and the right of others to express them. It's tragic what is happening at so many American universities where college administrators and faculties have become complicit in functioning essentially as speech police, deciding which, what speech is permissible and what speech isn't. You see violent protests that the senior senator from California referred to enacting effectively a heckler's veto where violent thugs come in and say, this particular speaker, I disagree with what he or she has to say. And therefore, I will threaten physical violence if the speech is allowed to happen. And far too many colleges and universities 
quietly roll over and say, okay, the threat of violence, we will effectively reward the violent criminals and muzzle the First Amendment. And I saw a recent study from the Knight Foundation that said that a majority of college students believe the climate on their campus has prevented people from saying what they believe out of fear of giving offense. What an indictment of our university system. And what does it say about what you think about your own ideas? If ideas are strong, if ideas are right, you don't need to muzzle the opposition. You should welcome the opposition. When you see college faculties and administrators being complicit or active players in silencing those with opposing views, what they are saying is they are afraid. They are afraid that their ideas cannot stand the dialectic, cannot stand opposition, cannot stand facts or reasoning or anything on the other side. And it is only through force and power that their ideas can be accepted. I'm one who agrees with John Stuart Mill. The best solution for bad ideas, for bad speech, is more speech and better ideas. Are there people with noxious ideas in the world? Absolutely. The Nazis are grotesque and repulsive and evil. And under our Constitution, they have a right to speak, and the rest of us have a moral obligation to denounce what they say. The Ku Klux Klan are a bunch of racist, bigoted thugs who have a right to express their views. And we have an obligation then to confront those views which are weak, poisonous, and wrong and confront them with truth. We don't need to use brute force to silence them because truth is far more powerful than force. So this is an important hearing. I thank the witnesses for being here. And I thank the chairman for hosting it. Uh, Senator Cruz is chairman of the Subcommittee on Constitution. Uh, Senator Blumenthal is a ranking member. I go to Senator Blumenthal now. Thanks, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you uh, to all my colleagues for their comments and to the witnesses for being here today on this very important topic. Uh, we would do well to remember that this issue is hardly new to democracies, and in particular our democracy. Uh, I can remember well as a young Harvard student, uh, observing the visit of Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara to our campus during the height of the beginning of the Vietnam controversy when his car literally was pounded on and he was physically threatened by protesters. Uh, the Vietnam protest movement, like others, often lent itself to excesses that seemed threatening at the time. And then as a reporter, I had the privilege of covering the convention in Chicago in 1968, yeah. not in the convention hall, but in the streets where tear gas and physical confrontation were more common than rational discourse. It is the essence of democracies that we have diversity, as Senator Cruz observed quite correctly, and diversity involves differences and differences of opinion can lead to disagreements which in turn can lead to conflict, physical conflict. And what we celebrate always on this committee is the rule of law which establishes lanes and also lines as in town halls that many of us conduct where people have to wait in line rather than interrupting each other so that the rule of law really provides a sense of order and a, a respect for each other's opinions. And that brings me finally to the main point that I think I want to make, which is that respect for the rule of law is really so fundamental to this conversation. And disrespect for the rule of law we have seen all too often outside the universities as well as in. The universities are not isolated enclaves that, that are in some ways aberrant. The kinds of confrontations that we've seen on universities reflect the fighting words that often are used by politicians and others in our society that may be designed to provoke 
violence. And we should be mindful of our own duties to be respectful of the law and to make sure that we particularly respect the First Amendment, which says, as Senator Feinstein quoted it so well, no law abridging those rights. Now, I recognize that some of our justices or judges have said no law means absolutely no law, but we also know that there is a need for balance. And the balance is not easily struck by simple sweeping generalizations. These issues are complex and they do involve balance. And uh, I would just emphasize how important respect for the rule of law and the setting of time and place and manner definitions for the exercise of these rights is on campuses, at rallies, in town halls, all across this great country. I, as a prosecutor and state attorney general, federal prosecutor and, and state attorney general advocated laws against hate speech, or hate crimes, I should say, and respect for speech that could be preserved. And the striking of that balance is just one area where I think we need to take lessons from the experience that you bring to us today. And while we're talking about the respect for the rule of law, Mr. Chairman, I want to take this opportunity to thank you and uh, Ranking Member Feinstein for beginning our investigation and inquiry into political interference in the Department of Justice, uh, exemplified by the firing of Director Comey and related actions. And I hope that we will pursue that political interference promptly and rigorously and comprehensively because I think, again, uh, any kind of interference, obstruction of justice or related criminal activity or civil interference with the rule of law, I think bears uh, very, very close scrutiny and examination by this committee. We have that duty. And I am very thankful that uh, you, Mr. Chairman, and our ranking member are proceeding along this course, and I want to publicly thank you for it. Thank you. Out of respect for Senator Durbin's schedule and being Democratic whip, I'll call on him for a few. Well, that's comments. very kind of you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. And I'll try to make this uh, brief and to the point. It was 11 years ago, and there was a debate on the floor of the United States Senate on the First Amendment, freedom of expression, freedom of speech. And let me read what one of our colleagues said about our debate and our decision when it came to that free speech. He said, this is Senator Daniel Inouye, Democrat of Hawaii, who was awarded the Medal of Honor for his service in World War II. Here's what he said. This objectionable expression is obscene, it's painful, it's unpatriotic. But I believe Americans gave their lives in many wars to make certain all Americans have the right to express themselves, even those who harbor hateful thoughts. In just a few words with economy of style, Senator Inouye put his finger right on what this debate is all about. The fact that we have to be prepared, if we believe in this Constitution and this Bill of Rights and freedom of expression, to, as the Senator from Texas said earlier, to sit back and put up with some hateful comments, some hateful conduct, racist comments, anti-Semitic comments, all of the above. The reason I bring up the quote from Senator Inouye was the debate was about the flag-burning amendment. The flag-burning amendment, which basically failed by one vote on the floor of the Senate to ban the desecration of the flag by burning, to make an exception, the first exception in history, to our Bill of Rights and freedom of speech. Do I find the burning of an American flag hateful? You bet I do. And I'll bet everyone in this room agrees with it. But it tests the same basic principle. Are we prepared to defend a person's right to do that as much as we hate it in the name of standing behind this constitutional principle? Well, we missed by one vote of changing the Constitution when it came to the desecration of the flag. It was painful, as painful as it gets, I think on the Senate Judiciary Committee, but a reminder of what we pay and the cost 
that is exacted when we stand behind this principle of free speech. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. I'm going to introduce uh, our guests now from my left to my right, and then we'll have you speak in that same order, and then we'll ask questions after all have spoken. Uh, Zachary Wood is Robert L. Bartley Fellow, Wall Street Journal, and class of 2018 Herbert H. H. Lehman Scholar at Williams College, where he served as president of Uncomfortable Learning, a student group that sparked national controversy for inviting provocative speech speakers to campus. Frederick Lawrence is the 10th Secretary and CEO of Phi Beta Kappa Society. He has previously served as President of Brandeis University. He received his bachelor's degree from Williams College and law degree from Yale. Isaac Smith is a law student at the University of Cincinnati, where he's also pursuing a Master's of Arts in Political Science. He earned his Bachelor's of Arts from Ohio University. While at Ohio University, Isaac was Associate Director of Students Defending Students, a student organization that assists students accused of violating the school's code of conduct. Fanto Aw, Dr. Fanto Aw is Interim Vice President of Campus Life at American University here in D.C. Dr. Aw earned all of her degrees from American University, BSBA in Accounting, MA in Public Administration, a PhD in Sociology, Eugene Volok, and if I pronounce it wrong, you correct me, is uh, Gary, a. Gary T. Schwartz, Distinguished Professor of Law, UCLA School of Law, where he is a noted academic expert, First Amendment. The professor obtained both his BS in Math, Computer Science, and JD from UCLA, Richard Cohen, is an attorney and president of the Southern Poverty Law Center. Mr. Cohen is a graduate of the Columbia University and University of Virginia School of Law. Floyd Abrams, senior counsel, New York law firm of Cahill Gordon Randall, and is a leading First Amendment litigator. He received his BA from Cornell University and his JD from Yale Law School. Before you start to speak, uh, Zachary Wood, Two things, I never gavel people down at the end of five minutes, but I hope when the red light goes on that you can sum up very quickly. Also, for my colleagues, we have two votes at 11, and it's going to be very necessary for us to keep the uh, committee meeting going while we cast those two votes, so I hope people will take turns uh, chairing uh, while, so we can keep the testimony and questions going. Uh, Mr. Wood, would you proceed, please? And by the way, your entire statement will be put in the record, your longer statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Madam Ranking Member, and distinguished members of the committee. I am honored and privileged to have the opportunity to appear before you. My name is Zach Wood. I am a senior and the president of Uncomfortable Learning at Williams College. Over the last two years, I have advocated for the importance of engaging controversial and offensive views on college campuses. And when I arrived at Williams College to begin my freshman year, I had high hopes that my intellectual experience would stimulate vigorous debate and encourage robust and open discussion of controversial issues. I identify as a liberal Democrat who supports many progressive causes, yet I adamantly believe that students should be encouraged to engage with people and ideas that they vehemently disagree with. As president of Uncomfortable Learning at Williams, I strive to broaden the range of political discourse on campus by inviting speakers with challenging, provocative, and out of the mainstream views on pressing issues of our time. I joined Uncomfortable Learning because I wanted to push my intellectual limits. I wanted to confront controversy. I wanted to clarify the issues that challenge people the most and why. I wanted to discuss the content of competing arguments and how best to respond to unwelcome ideas and defensive speech. Humanity is not limited to the views and values we admire. Humanity also encompasses the thought and action we resist. To gain a deeper understanding of humanity, 
I've made a concerted effort to understand as thoroughly as possible the visions and convictions of those whose arguments I diametrically oppose. In doing so, I have faced considerable backlash from the student body. The acrimonious response was jarring, yet I resolved to ignore the ad hominem attacks and continue pressing forward. During my sophomore year, I invited pop math author and conservative commentator John Derbyshire to speak at Williams about race and national identity. My announcement of Derbyshire's invitation angered many students and faculty on campus precisely because John Derbyshire had previously made incendiary comments about African Americans. Within 48 hours of the event, the president of Williams College unilaterally canceled the speaker. Days later, the president enacted new speaker policies that made bringing speakers to campus an especially arduous process for my student group. What I find impermissible, undemocratic, and antithetical to the intellectual character of the college I attend is the president's decision to disinvite a speaker solely on the basis of his inflammatory remarks about race. At Williams, the administration promotes social tolerance, often at the expense of political tolerance. In my time at Williams, I cannot name a single conservative speaker that has been brought to campus by the administration. This fact is problematic precisely because the overwhelming majority of students at Williams have liberal beliefs. This adds to what many commentators have referred to as the echo chamber. In classrooms, liberal arguments are often treated as unquestionable truths. In some cases, conservative students even feel the need to refrain from stating their opinion in fear of being shut down. I appreciate the desire of my administration to ensure that all students on campus feel included. Yet, I deplore the state of free speech and intellectual freedom on my college campus. In our present moment, Williams is just one of many colleges that has disinvited controversial speakers. At colleges and universities across the country, students face free speech codes, free speech zones, and other infringements on their First Amendment rights. Instead of nurturing thoughtful debate of controversial topics, many college educators and administrators discourage free debate by shielding students from offensive views. Yet, one person's offensive view is another person's viewpoint. To some, ardent defense of free speech is characterized as a conservative attack on liberal progressivism. It is said that the real issues that need to be discussed on college campuses are not free speech and intellectual freedom, but racism, sexism, and microaggressions. To be sure, those issues are critically important. Yet the fundamental problem with this characterization is that all of these issues intersect and none of them can be resolved without an appreciation of free speech and intellectual freedom in higher education. For me, free speech is not about grinding a partisan act, a partisan acts. It's not about promoting or advancing a particular set of ideological preferences. I care deeply about my education and I value the freedom to interrogate all manner of contentious ideas and beliefs in hope of gaining a deeper understanding of the world and using that knowledge to one day make a positive difference in the lives of others. For me, free speech and intellectual freedom matters because free speech and intellectual freedom are among the founding principles that animate the vibrance and ensure the sustenance of our democracy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Madam Ranking Member, distinguished members of the panel. Uh, may I start with a point of personal privilege and say as a Williams College alumnus and former trustee, I am proud to be sitting next to what my college is now producing. Uh, members of the committee, the challenges of free expression on our campuses have never seemed greater. I know this from my years as a law school dean and as a university president, that these challenges come in all directions and from all contexts. They come from the left and they come from the right. They involve students, they involve faculty, they involve outside speakers, as Mr. Wood has just talked about. Given in the coarsening of our public discourse and the lack of clarity about our core value of free expression, it's perhaps no surprise that this issue now presents itself with such urgency on our campuses, public and private, small liberal arts colleges, and large research universities. So at this moment, it is 
particularly important that we recommit ourselves to first principles, and this hearing is a welcome opportunity to begin to do so. The ranking member poignantly talked of the context of large universities, and perhaps as the only person sitting in this room who has been a university president, I am grateful for someone understanding the complexities of that role. It is precisely at times that university presidents face, like these we're talking about, that first principles are essential. And let me restate three. First, as each of you has mentioned, robust free expression and free inquiry are central to the mission of our colleges and universities. Second, the limits of such expression, which should be all the way at the margins of expression, expressive activity, should turn on the intent of the actor and not on some crude attempt on our part to distinguish speech from conduct. An intent to threaten, an intent to intimidate is different from an intent to express, an intent to communicate. And third, there is an obligation, indeed, as Senator Cruz said, a moral obligation in my view, to respond to hateful speech, not to suppress it, but to respond clearly and forcefully. Universities and colleges in this country have a mission, I would say a sacred mission, to create and discover knowledge and transmit that knowledge through our teaching and our scholarship. So it should go without saying that robust free expression is central to that. As a result, speakers are presumed to be permitted to speak and should expect to face questions and answers. Students, and to give answers, students and faculty are presumed to have their writing and their speaking protected. So is there a limit to this expression? When does it cross over from protected expression into something that would be prohibited, or in a con campus context, into a context where sanctions would be appropriate? As I said, I believe this turns on the intent of the actor. Let me give a different example from Williams College, and this is with the prior president of Williams College, although, Mr. Chairman, that prior president is now the president of Northwestern University, so he does seem to keep coming up in this discussion. When I was a trustee at Williams, there was an event in which a student had had on her door, the leader of the Jewish student group at Williams on her door, posted a flyer that said she should evacuate her room immediately and this was meant as a faux eviction notice to parody what has happened in Israel with Palestinian homes in the Israeli Defense Force. The president of the college called me up and said, is there something we can do about this? And I said, we need to know what is in the mind of the student who did this. He said, how would we possibly know that? I said, well, why don't we find out how those flyers were distributed? Was it just put on one student's door in an attempt to threaten and intimidate her? Or, as turned out to be the case, were they put on the doors of every one of the doors in that dorm, in which case, in my view and in his, it was a attempt to demonstrate a strongly held political view, offensive to some, disagreeable to many, but nonetheless one that should be protected. And therefore, the speech was protected, no conduct should be taken, uh, no action should be taken for that conduct. But what of speech that is protected that is particularly hateful? Here I go back to something that Senator Cruz said at the beginning. I believe Justice Brandeis had it right when he said the answer is not enforced silence, but more speech. But more speech is not merely an option in the time in which we're living. It is an obligation. And so a university president has an obligation to speak out in the face of hateful speech, not to repress it, but to speak out. A wise president will be very careful not to be calling First Amendment balls and strikes on a daily basis. That debases the currency of the presidency, and it oversteps the boundaries. But if a wise president picks her or his moment to say this kind of conduct, this kind of expression is not representative of the best values of this college, the best values of this university, then that holds us to the highest levels of what our colleges and our universities are about. Not merely to educate, but to provide the citizenry that is the essence of an engaged democracy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman Grassley, Ranking Member Feinstein, and distinguished members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to share my story with you today. My name is Isaac Smith, and I am a rising third-year law student at the University of Cincinnati. <laughs> Prior to attending UC for law school, I studied political science and Spanish at Ohio University, where I was also involved with an organization called Students Defending, St 
<clears throat> excuse me, students defending students. We assisted students on campus accused of violating the school's code of conduct, helping them through the disciplinary process. And every year, to raise awareness about the organization and our work, we produce t-shirts with a funny slogan on the back. In 2012, our t-shirt said, who you going to call, with the O's made up by handcuffs. But our 2013 shirts, which displayed our founding slogan, we get you off for free, I've got one here, <laughs> proved to be unexpectedly controversial. Uh, what flew in the 70s when Students Defending Students was founded, it turns out, did not fly in 2013. We wore our shirts at the Student Involvement Fair, a gathering of registered student organizations on the main campus green where freshmen can learn about campus activities. SDS was present to recruit new members. I posted a picture on our official Twitter account of one of our members handing out flyers while wearing the shirt. A campus administrator saw the tweet and later told us that we were not to wear these shirts again. She told us that the shirts objectified women and in a total head scratcher that they promoted prostitution. That was worrying to us because as advisors about the student conduct process, we knew the student code of conduct inside and out. Although our slogan was unquestionably protected by the First Amendment, our campus policies were so broad that we risked discipline for wearing the shirts. And I knew that OU has a history of punishing students for protected speech. So I reached out to the Foundation for Individual Rights and in Education, or FIRE, a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization that defends free speech on college campuses. And with FIRE's help, I sued Ohio University to fix those sections of the Code of Conduct that would have allowed us to be punished and even expelled for wearing the shirts. And after that lawsuit, change happened. After only a few months, OU settled the lawsuit favorably, changing the Code of Conduct so that it protected free expression and paying out $32,000 in damages. We were also allowed to wear the shirts again. It is unfortunate that I had to take such serious action to get things fixed, but sometimes that's what needs to be done. Some administrators are not going to pay attention to what's legally right unless they are forced to do so. And my experience at Ohio University was unfortunately not isolated. Examples of campus censorship are plentiful. In one case, a former student at Cal Poly Pomona needed a free speech badge to hand out literature promoting animal rights and a vegan diet in his school's free speech zone. In another case, a former student at my current school, the University of Cincinnati, was threatened with arrest for trespassing, for gathering signatures outside of the University of Cincinnati's free speech zone. And there have been multiple cases across the country where students have been prevented from distributing copies of the United States Constitution in open outdoor areas of their campuses because they were doing so outside of their schools misleadingly labeled free speech zones. And I would like to thank you, Chairman Grassley, for bringing up an example of such a thing in your opening remarks. Taken together, what this means is that we know that administrators nationwide are stifling free speech. So I thank you again for the opportunity to testify here and share my story and for putting the spotlight on this national problem. Chairman Grassley, Ranking Member Feinstein, and the committee, thank you for the opportunity for being here today. The challenge for leaders on America's campuses today is to maintain balance when protecting important values that are often in tension especially in the context of our nation's political climate and considering views of the First Amendment among younger Americans compared with the generation that have come before them. Freedom of expression is an important principle on colleges and universities, not just public universities where First Amendment rights must be protected, but also private institutions because our fundamental mission to create, share, and exchange ideas. Knowledge and discovery is dependent on the basic tenet of academic freedom and the free expression of ideas. Another important principle is the respect and dignity with which we expect all members of our community to demonstrate when exchanging ideas, particularly divergent ideas. Civil discourse and dialogue representing diverse perspective is integral to learning and scholarship. These principles are fundamental to educating citizens who will lead productive lives and contribute to a healthy democracy. 
Campuses around the country, including American University, have seen a rise in the episode of deeply offensive speech and expression. From racist statement and acts to flag burning. These expressions come from within, from our own students, faculty and staff, as well as from forces outside our community. Whether a visit from West Westboro Baptist Church or Milo Yiannopoulos, as an institution committed to freedom of expression and diversity and inclusion that sees dissent and protests as manifestation of free expressions, we have effectively managed numerous events that would be deemed controversial. We're guided in this work by our freedom of expression and dissent guidelines and by the American University Faculty Senate Resolution on Freedom of Expression. The resolution states that hundred, for hundreds of years, the pursuit of knowledge has been at the center of university life, unfettered discourse, no matter how controversial, inconvenient, and uncomfortable, is a condition necessary to that pursuit. American University stands in this tradition. As an institution, we draw the line when expression that has potential to incite violence and or is a direct threat to members of our community. The most recent among these episodes of speech is currently being investigated as a hate crime by the FBI. On the last day of classes this spring, racist expressions threaten physical violence to African American women who are members of Alpha Kappa Alpha Incorporated, one of whom was the first black woman elected as student government president in her first day in office. With the increasing frequency of such episode, the ability of students to learn and thrive has been severely limited. When students fear for their safety, this affects their ability to study and participate fully in the life of the university. In short, maintaining a commitment to our values and balance among them is complicated and requires robust policies as well as constant education and training. American University has robust policies for protecting freedom of expression and dissent, as well as academic freedom. We must also investigate, respond, track, and report crimes that are motivated by bias as required by both federal law and the Clery Act and local laws. Just, just as local laws treat, uh, uh, treat bias as an aggravating factor in sentencing for crimes, so too does our code of student conduct which was modified this year to consider bias motivation in sanctions for those found responsible for violations. If there's a takeaway from this testimony is that free speech comes with responsibility and accountability. Freedom of, of expression is integral to the mission of higher education. However, protecting it has become increasingly challenging in light of our national, national climate, changing attitudes of younger Americans about the First Amendment, and ever more diverse populations on our campuses bringing diverse perspectives and expectations into constant tension. Thank you. It's technology. Too complicated for me. Uh, thank you. Uh, so just yesterday, the Supreme Court reaffirmed that there is no hate speech exception to the First Amendment and that viewpoint discrimination is generally speaking forbidden, uh, in, including not just as to criminal laws, but even as to, in that case, exclusion from various trademark programs that uh, the government ran. Um, and uh, the same applies uh, uh, to uh, speech on college campuses, uh, that the government may not uh, uh, punish speech because of the viewpoint it expresses, whether it views it hateful or otherwise. And Justice Kennedy, in writing for four of the eight justices who participated, I think quite well put this, that a law that can be, can be directed against speech found offensive can be turned against a minority and dissenting views to the detriment of all. Uh, that uh, uh, even seemingly ve uh, very appealing restrictions on speech that was broadly condemned uh, as, uh, as wrong and offensive uh, can very quickly turn into suppression of dissent and historically often have. Um, uh, l let me illustrate this with, uh, uh, with an example from the testimony of uh, uh, Dean Lawrence, actually testimony that I in general very much agreed uh, with, uh, including in its uh, rejection of an exception, for, a proposed exception for hate speech, but note the definition that was offered.
interpret there. By hateful speech, I mean that which offends or insults a group along racial, ethnic, national, religious, gender, or sexual identity lines. Again, I should stress Dean Lawrence did not call for suppression of such speech, but many people do, and that's actually a not uncommon sort of definition. But if you look at it closely, what that means is a vast range of speech, flag burning, which I actually entirely agree uh, should be constitutionally protected. Well, that offends uh, uh, along national lines. Debates about religion will often offend uh, groups along religious lines, as with speech that is perceived as blasphemous. Debates about same-sex marriage, if you're going to have an honest debate about it, it will indeed uh, offend some people along sexual identity or sexual orientation lines. Uh, condemnations of uh, white privilege and, uh, and the like may offend people along racial lines, whether, whether or not they're accurate and sound or not. Uh, so I think we're, the court has been quite right in rejecting any such exception. Uh, uh, I th um, uh, now, there is, of course, uh, there are, of course, times, as uh, Senator Feinstein pointed out, uh, uh, that uh, the university isn't trying to suppress speech because it finds it offensive, uh, but because enough uh, uh, people who are willing to stoop to violence find it offensive, that there is then the threat of a violent reaction to such speech. But I, I tend to agree with, with Senator Cruz's view that that kind of heckler's veto should not be allowed. The question was asked, uh, when you have a set group of people who come to create a disturbance, what do you do? I think the answer is to make sure they don't create a disturbance and to threaten them with punishment, meaningful punishment, if they do create a disturbance, and not to essentially let them have their way by suppressing the speech that they're trying to suppress. One of the basics of psychology that uh, I think we've learned, and all of us who are parents, I think, have learned it very firsthand, uh, is behavior that is rewarded is repeated. Uh, and that when thugs learn that all they need to do in order to suppress speech is to threaten violence, uh, then there'll be more such threats and more such threats from all over the political spectrum. And I think the solution to that is to say that the speech will go on, and if that means bringing in more law enforcement and, again, making sure that those people who do act violently or otherwise physically disruptively, uh, that they be punished. In this, I very much agree uh, with what Senator Blumenthal said. Respect for the rule of law is a fundamental principle of American life and a fundamental principle that universities should be teaching. And one of that, that aspect of that is if you violate the law, and by here, this I mean laws against vandalism, laws against violence, laws against physically shouting people down, uh, then in that case uh, you will be punished rather than having your, uh, your goals be achieved by having the speaker whom you're trying to suppress, in fact, be suppressed by the university. Uh, so uh, it seems to me that uh, uh, the courts have made it quite clear, and I think uh, my sense is that the view of the committee uh, is then likely the view of, uh, of the Congress is quite clear on this as well, that speech has to be protected uh, on universities, campuses, as elsewhere, regardless of, uh, uh, of its viewpoint. Some speech should indeed uh, uh, lead to counter speech, lead to uh, criticism, whether by university officials or by others. Uh, but there is no and should be no exception for supposedly uh, hateful speech uh, uh, or speech of any other viewpoint, whether flag burning or otherwise, uh, on university campuses or elsewhere. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Grassley. Thank you, uh, Ranking Member Feinstein. It's an honor to appear before the committee this morning, particularly with my fellow panelists. I think we all agree on certain fundamental points, and that is that the First Amendment is of paramount importance, particularly at institutions of higher education. Yet, in recent months, the commitment of our, uni of our universities to the First Amendment has been tested as speakers from a newly energized white nationalist movement have been making their ions on college campuses. These speakers, particularly S Richard Spencer, Spencer and Milo Ianopoulos, have drawn protest not simply from students, but from loosely organized violence-prone outside groups of so-called anti-fascists. The presence of these anti-fascist uh, groups has led to an equal yet opposite reaction, the formation of outside groups dedicated to fighting the anti-fascists. As what's happened at Berkeley demonstrates, it's a combustible situation. This April, Richard Spencer was scheduled to speak at Auburn University, 50 miles from our office in Montgomery. Spencer, as I'm sure the committee knows, is a leading white nationalist figure who popularized the term alt-right at a highly publicized white nationalist rally shortly after the presidential election, Spencer gave a speech ending with Hail Trump, as many in the audience sig heiled. 
the event catapulted him to national process, uh, prominence. In his first college speech following his, his November rally, Spencer stated, America belongs to white men. We own it. In advance of Spencer's scheduled appearance at Auburn, we checked to ensure that the university police knew about the problems that other universities had recently faced when controversial speakers came to town. We also suggested to university administrators and to the college club we sponsor at Auburn that they hold an alternative event to highlight their commitment to inclusion and to our nation's democratic values. We have no objection, of course, to peaceful protests, but we suggest that students not give racists an audience, and we certainly don't want students to do anything that allows speakers to portray, uh, racist speakers to portray themselves as First Amendment martyrs. Auburn initially issued a statement making it clear that it deployed Spencer's views, and it was the right thing to do. The First Amendment doesn't require universities to be neutral when racist speakers come to town. As Senator Cruz said, they can and should take a position. But then Auburn canceled the speech out of fear that Spencer's presence would provoke violence. And that was the wrong thing to do, because the university was perfectly capable of providing for security. As Senator Feinstein has suggested, there may be some cases where that's not the, that may be some instances where that's not the case and universities have to take steps to cancel a speech. As Justice Jackson said in Terminello, this, the Constitution is not a suicide fact, pact, but that would be a rare instance. Auburn lost the case in court and handed Richard Spencer a victory in the process, an outcome that allows a man whose views are inimical to our founding principles to parade around as a First Amendment hero. Given the climate in our country, I think we'll see more violent confrontations on college campuses when school starts this fall. As Representative Mark Sanford recently put it, the rhetoric surrounding the presidential campaign has unearthed some demons. Since the election, we've documented nearly 200 instances of racist flyers being distributed on college campuses. We've also detected a surge of bias-related acts of harassment, intimidation, and violence in schools and communities across the country. This Sunday, Richard Spencer is scheduled to speak at a rally at the Lincoln Memorial, something that I find to be almost sacrilegious. He'll be joined by the founder of one of the white nationalist groups that has been recruiting on college campuses. Their First Amendment rights must be protected. But we must not ignore the increase in white nationalist activity around the country and on our college campuses. We need to fight speech that threatens our nation's democratic values with speech that upholds them. It's an obligation that university officials have and that everyone in public life, starting with the president, has as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cohen. Mr. Abrams. Thank you. Uh, uh, Senator Grassley, uh, Ranking Member Feinstein, Senator Cruz, and other members of the committee that, that are here. Uh, I wanted to add another line from uh, the Supreme Court's opinion yesterday uh, in which the court, by an eight to nothing vote, said the following. Uh, speech may not be banned on the ground that it expresses ideas that offend. That is the law. That is what the First Amendment teaches us. That was the basis of yesterday's ruling. It has been the basis phrased differently through the years, but phrased consistently through the years. That has been the basis for the protection of First Amendment rights. What brings us here today is that time and again, speech is being effectively banned on campuses because the speaker has ideas that offend. That's the problem. It does not arise in the main because university administrations are seeking to suppress speech. It arises more often than not because students find it intolerable to have certain speakers appear and certain ideas expressed with which they disagree and which they find offensive or even uh, outrageous. And so we have a record before this committee from the testimony of the people who have preceded me 
Uh, and from what has occurred throughout America of speakers being silenced uh, when they say or are expected to say uh, unpopular or d disagreeable things. Ray Kelly, the, the distinguished former police commissioner of New York, shouted down at Brown University. Uh, the mayor of Jerusalem shouted down at San Francisco State. Uh, I could go on with those examples. There are situations of invitations being withdrawn for fear of offending students. Uh, Christine Lagarde, the first woman ever to head the International Monetary Fund, canceled uh, for fear of student uh, disapproval uh, and the like. We have speakers who have withdrawn because it has been made very clear to them that they would be unable to proceed with their speeches. Uh, Condoleezza Rice, for example. Uh, and we have a situation in which, uh, again and again, speakers have been muted on campuses by saying that they could appear but only appear uh, if they appeared on panels and not spoke individually. So this is a real, a real ongoing problem. It is not a new problem of this month or even this year, but it is something which has gotten significantly worse uh, and more threatening uh, as time has gone on and as other speakers have pointed out, uh, as the polarity in our country has become more uh, obvious, uh, the polarity on campuses has been the same. Uh, I, ha I have to say that I recall a time uh, many years ago when I was in college in which the real problem was that there was no speech. Uh, 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 that, that, that was the cool generation, so-called, uh, in which uh, university administrations uh, really came down hard. If anyone said anything which seemed to offend the administration, uh, that's not our problem today. We have, I have to say it, uh, a problem with students and sup supine administrations. We have a problem in that uh, too many uh, people are unwilling to listen to ideas with which they disagree. And that is a problem which has only a long-term solution, but it is one I suggest to you that we should really start to address now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Abrams, and thank you to each of the witnesses for your important and powerful testimony. Uh, let me start with Zach and Isaac. I want to thank the both of you for being here. I want to thank you for the, your courage in speaking out and, and risking persecution in doing so. Um, it's important and it's significant. Um, and with both of you, uh, you may both have views that I agree with or disagree with on any given issue, but you have the courage of your convictions, and that's important. Uh, I wanted to ask both of you, when, when those who disagreed with either your views or the views of speakers who were coming to campus succeeded in shutting them down, did that embolden the censors? What, what did that do to the, camp, to the climate on the campus when, when people discovered a heckler's veto could succeed? Mr. Wood? At Williams, it was in some sense a victory for those who did not want to hear opposing views. So that, you know, their perspective from the outset was that if we can shut this down, then we are doing something that is just and right. Mr. Smith. Uh, my experience at Ohio University was primarily with censorship coming from the direction of the administration. Um, and in my experience with students defending students, we actually had the administration on one occasion um, say that although the speech was protected by the First Amendment, that a student um, was accused of violating the Code of Conduct for the Code of Conduct rose above that. Um, and they punished him anyway. With the overbroad language of the code, um, I definitely agree that they were emboldened to um, try to take out any viewpoint that they found uh, offensive. Uh, Professor Valak, I want to welcome you to this committee. Uh, you and I have been friends now 20 years. Um, I will say two of my favorite memories were one, you and I and several others, uh, the day after September 11th, 
uh, spending time together in an interfaith prayer session with Christians and Jews together praying for our nation. Uh, I'll never forget that. Nor will I forget a wonderful time in which you had Heidi and me over to your apartment for dinner and baked cookies. And you probably don't recall this, but you pulled the cookies out of the, the oven and mumbled to yourself, really to no one in particular, oh my, their constitutive integrity is somewhat compromised. <laughs> At which point, Heidi looked at me and said, who are these friends of yours? And I said, no one on earth but Eugene Volokh would possibly utter such a sentiment. Um, it, is, it is great to welcome you back, and, and thank you for being such a, a passionate champion of the First Amendment. Uh, one of the things that you have written about is, is the impact of federal law and federal statutory law, Title VII, Title IX, in pushing universities in the direction of censoring speech. And, and I'm wondering if you could perhaps elaborate on that a little bit for this committee. Uh, yes. Uh, 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 thank, thanks very much for asking. Those are two of my favorite memories as well. <laughs> Though the cookies really, <laughs> they were a little, little gooey. But I think that made them taste better. Uh, uh, so uh, p part of the problem that's happening on campuses uh, is, uh, is that the Office for Civil Rights some years ago, uh, I believe the Department of Education Office of Civil Rights, but also with some support from the Justice Department, took the view that actually federal law required uh, colleges and universities to uh, uh, impose speech codes uh, to prevent supposedly hostile or offensive environments, uh, which were defined really in very vague ways, but in ways that pretty clearly covered speech that would allegedly uh, create such environments by being offensive based on sex was a particular focus, but the same logic would apply to speech that's offensive based on race, religion, and such. Uh, and uh, uh, colleges had been trying to implement those kinds of speech codes, at least many had, for many years before. Uh, but OCR was giving kind of cover, I think, to those who wanted to and putting pressure on those who might not. And I think that's very much a mistake. I do think that universities should try to prevent uh, a, a, uh, an atmosphere where people feel, uh, uh, certainly feel threatened. True threats of violence are certainly not constitutionally protected, but also feel otherwise uh, 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 intimidated or marginalized based on various things, including based on politics. Uh, but universities have ample opportunity to do that uh, by speaking out against the speech. Often there will be lots of student groups who are willing to participate in and speaking out against this kind of very offensive speech and telling students, yes, you are welcome here, notwithstanding what a small minority might be saying. So rather than taking advantage of this opportunity for counter speech or urging universities to take advantage for counter speech, something that universities are uniquely well positioned to do because they are in control uh, and they often have, uh, have uh, people who are willing to help out in that uh, among the student body. Instead, the OCR uh, argued uh, that, in fact, speech codes are not just a proper solution but a necessary, a required solution. I think that's very much a mistake. Uh, fortunately, federal courts have not taken that view. They, in fact, have taken the opposite view. Uh, my recollection is in the early 2000s, uh, uh, the OCR had actually said that the First Amendment uh, 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 is an important limit on campus speech codes. And then I think there was some, uh, some walking away from that uh, uh, several years ago from further statements, especially in the University of Montana case by the OCR. And I'm hoping that uh, the OCR will go back and reaffirm the principle that uh, uh, while uh, federal law prohibits universities from discriminating based on students and requires them to protect students against violence and against threats of violence, it offers no justification for speech restrictions. Thank you. And, and, and a final question. Mr. Abrams, you have been a, a lion of the First Amendment. Um, you're a man of the left. Um, I think it's fair to say I am not. Uh, you have spent decades defending free speech, even views you disagree with. Um, there are examples that are often pointed to, indeed, at this hearing, whether Nazis or the KKK. But one of the things we're seeing on university campuses, it's not just those extreme hate groups that are finding their speech center censored, but it's rather just speakers, academics with views that are disagreed, that are contrary to the reigning political orthodoxy on many campuses. Uh, whether it is an administrator sending an email about Halloween urging tolerance, whether it is people arguing about same-sex marriage, whether it is an academic scholar like Charles Murray making arguments that are controversial, whether it is an academic scholar like Heather McDonald speaking about police officers 
uh, what is the value of the First Amendment in protecting the views of those with whom we disagree, and what does it do to campuses when only one side of an issue is allowed to be expressed publicly? The First Amendment, uh, Senator Cruz, uh, at its core is an anti-sensorial amendment. It, it ex exists primarily for the purpose of keeping the government away from certain very, very significant and sensitive areas, religion, speech, press, assembly. Uh, uh, and the, the, the basic philosophy behind it is that it is important that the broadest range of views be heard and that the public be permitted to pass judgment, uh, come to their own judgments on it. I mean, uh, it's tempting. I, I mean, I get it. Everyone understands the temptation to say this view or that view is so offensive, so outrageous, that I'm serving the public interest by shutting it up. The First Amendment sends us in precisely the opposite direction. Uh, it requires at least uh, enough humility to accept the proposition that, that I'm not the decision maker and that Congress isn't the decision maker, but that the public, individually and together, make the decision about what to believe and what not to believe. Senator Durbin. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I have to leave and vote, so I only can ask a question or two. But I listened to the whole panel, and it seems like there's an amazing consensus, at least in the abstract. The problem is the application. Should I be able to stop a speaker because I'm offended? No. Mr. Lawrence, because I'm intimidated? I think yes. Should I be able to stop someone from speaking because he's unpopular? No. Because I find him menacing? Yes. Should I be able to stop someone who is makes me feel uncomfortable? No. But should I be able to stop someone who I find threatening or menacing? Intimidating? And where you draw the line? Now put yourself in the position of the president of the university. You want to encourage the exchange of ideas. Let's start with that premise. But you also have a responsibility for the safety of the students. And what might happen from those who come and attend a meeting and what their reaction might be. Now add another element. Ten states allow the carrying of guns on college campuses. Doesn't this make this a little more complicated for that college president as to whether or not that speaker is going to be allowed to come in and speak? So let me ask you to address that. Start with Mr. Cohen. Thank you. Um, I think it's an incredibly thorny issue. Universities have an obligation, I would say, to take reasonable steps that they can foresee in the event of violence. In other words, if you're a university, you can't do nothing, and then when, you know, when maybe threatening people show up, you say, oh, I'm going to cancel the speech. You have an obligation to make some bona fide efforts to protect the speaker, protect the students. But of course, there could be situations where at the 11th hour, you got information that 50 busloads of armed anti-fascists were coming to campus, and you'd have no choice but to cancel the speech. I think it's just as a matter of common sense, we have to allow the university to exercise some judgment in a perilous situation such as that. Mr. Abrams. I think the real issue is what's the rule and what's the exception? The rule has to be we allow speech. We don't censor speech. Uh, we, we don't rule out speakers because of the possibility that there'll be some sort of harmful impact because they speak. Sure, if a lot of people are coming to the campus with guns or threatening or the like, that's, that's one situation. That's very, very rare. But, I mean, what, what we're talking about remember today... Remember my premise here, 10 states with concealed carry law, it is yeah. like we're announcing we're bringing guns. Under the law, they are allowed to carry the guns onto the campus... So they are. That's, that has been the decision of, of, of the legislatures, and uh, so far it's, it's, it's perfectly constitutional. That does not empower college presidents to shut down campuses. There has to be more than a credible threat. 
mean, have we had a situation on campus in which, as a result of a speech, people who've come with guns have, have uh, committed felonies? I can't think of one. Thank God, no. Mr. Lawrence? Yeah, I think that Floyd has got it right, that the presumption is in favor of speech. The question is, when can you overcome that presumption? Uh, you certainly have situations on campuses now, and particularly in concealed carry jurisdictions, as you say, where this becomes an enormous concern for the university administration. And there have been cases, um, most of the time this information is not made public, where the university president, these are people I've spoken with, have been informed uh, by their own campus security that we have credible information from local law enforcement that there could be people uh, with weapons on campus. I, I appreciate the analogy to the heckler's veto, but the heckler's veto cases uh, come out of the 1960s and in southern jurisdictions that wanted to repress civil rights marches, and the answer there is they simply have to make sure there's enough of a police presence. You can't just tell a public safety office in a university, you've got to just beef up. Sometimes you just don't have those resources. So those are the kinds of judgments that a president of a university is required to make on a daily basis. I'd like to stay, but I have to go vote. I want to thank all of the panel yeah. for testifying. I'm going to start out with Mr. Wood uh, asking you to elaborate on a point that you made that students at Williams with minority political views feel silenced in the classroom. Yes, sir. Uh, so at Williams College, oftentimes it's conservatives on campus who feel as though they can't express their, their views. And I've talked to a number of students individually who have told me that they feel as though in certain classes if they were to express their political views, whether it's on the issue of affirmative action or whether it's on welfare or any number of uh, critical issues that are, that are often discussed, they feel as though they would be either strongly disliked or they would receive disapproval from their professors for simply stating their beliefs. And so I've tried to encourage them to do it, but I understand that it's very difficult when you feel as though it could affect the way in which your professor views you and sees you as someone who is only trying to make the most of your education. Okay, and also for you, uh, your testimony that Williams College adopted policies for inviting speakers that appeared to apply equally to all speakers, but that in practice made it harder for conservative speakers to come to campus than liberals. Uh, I'd like to have you elaborate that point. Yes. So essentially, Uncomfortable Learning was a student group at Williams College originally, but it was unaffiliated for a specific reason. And that reason was because college council, because the majority of the student body is liberal, was not going to vote to approve Uncomfortable Learning. That also means that if we were to go through College Council, we would have to receive funding for speakers from College Council, which would then give them discretion as to what speakers we could bring. What the President did after I invited John Derbyshire was he put several checkpoints in place that mean, first, I have to discuss with several deans why I've selected a particular speaker, if I'm willing to deal with the controversy. On top of that, you have to uh, you know, convey to them what the sources of funding are, and then you also have to register as a student group. This was a particular problem for uncomfortable learning precisely because the student body, not just the student body, but the deliberative body of the college, college council, was liberal, and so we were worried that the group wouldn't pass and wouldn't get approved as a student group, which means what? That we then wouldn't be allowed to bring speakers. So it forced me to, go, to have to go through a number of hoops and hurdles to just sort of be able to continue doing the work that I was already doing. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Abrams and Professor Volokh, uh, Dr. Awe testified that we respect a free speech. American University, quote, draws the line when expression has the potential to incite violence, end of quote. Of course, American is private, and the First Amendment does not apply, but is this statement consistent with the longstanding meaning of the First Amendment? Oh, I don't think so. I don't think the potential to in, uh, inspire violence comes close uh, to meeting the legal standard, uh, which requires an, an intent, a likelihood of success, an imminence of violence occurring. Uh, 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 I mean, there, there are speakers who by their nature are incendiary in what they say, and it, and it would be a, a, an egregious violation of the First Amendment and of First Amendment values uh, to bar them from speaking because there is a possibility uh, of uh, violence occurring. Professor Volokh, you want to add? Uh, I, I agree uh, with Mr. Abrams. I, I
had, uh, I'm sorry, I agree with Mr. Abrams. I had uh, understood uh, Dr. Oz's reference to potential to incite uh, violence as uh, something of a shorthand for the test that I think Mr. Abrams has quite correctly articulated, which is that speech is unprotected only if it is intended to and likely to produce imminent lawless conduct. There was once a time when the Supreme Court uh, accepted the notion that mere potential to produce uh, uh, bad conduct was enough. That was a so-called bad tendency test that was used uh, around the time of World War I in some early cases that upheld restrictions on speech. But the Supreme Court has quite rightly retreated from that. I think this ties into uh, uh, Senator Durbin's point. Actually, in 40 states, people can carry concealed guns legally um, in, uh, in public places where there often are speeches. And in 50 states, People can carry concealed guns illegally as well. Uh, there is certainly somebody who's willing to commit murder isn't going to balk uh, uh, at, at, at uh, restrictions on those kinds of laws. Nonetheless, the mere possibility that somebody uh, would, uh, uh, would draw a violent reaction or even hope to produce a violent reaction can't be enough to restrict the speech. And again, I understood Dr. Awe's uh, statement as sort of shorthand for the more specific point that Mr. Abrams mentioned. Uh, Senator Feinstein. Thanks. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Chairman. Um, I wanted to ask uh, Mr. Cohen um, this question. Um, I'm holding a copy of a May 1, 2017 paper from the Southern Poverty Law Center, the title of which is The Battle for Berkeley in the Name of Freedom of Speech, the Radical Right is Circling the Ivory Tower to ensure a voice for the alt-right. Uh, could you please describe for us the thrust of this paper and any comments you would care to make? Thank you, Senator Feinstein. Uh, at Berkeley, and in particular, uh, as uh, protests have escalated, so has the presence of uh, groups that really have violence uh, on their minds. Uh, we've had uh, the kind of anti-fascist de uh, 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 descend on Berkeley, and in response to them, we've had groups such as the Oath Keepers, uh, law enforcement, of current and former law enforcement officials, who take a pledge to uphold the Constitution in their view not as it might be interpreted by the courts or their superiors. We've had other uh, right, uh, uh, radical right groups, the Proud Boys, a new group called the Alt Knights, uh, come to college campuses really raring for a fight. Uh, my sympathy goes out to uh, the uh, university's of officials at Berkeley because they had been faced with an increasingly incendiary situation. It's one of the reasons why I think it's really quite important for uh, public officials at all levels, people in our churches, our synagogues, and our mosques, to do what they can to tamp down the rhetoric and really speak out on behalf of the values of our democracy. One of the problems that I have is that there is an expectation that the university handles it. The handling of it means that you have resources to be able to um, send, and those resources know what to do. Um, in, particularly for the public university, uh, and particularly for the University of California, there is a constant battle with the legislature over money. Yes. So the resources are not always what they might be. Um, does anyone on the panel have an idea, if you accept what Mr. Cohen has said, how should a university handle this? If, if I can speak to, oh, sorry, if I can speak briefly to that, I appreciate the resource constraints. I teach at UC, we're aware of the resource constraints. Yeah. This having been said, while we're fortunate to have a, a UC Police Department, uh, we also are in a city. And perhaps there are some. But that's Berkeley. Uh, yes, and I would think that Berkeley Police Department will also be uh, able and should be willing to lend uh, uh, police officers to help out. If we are in a position where our police departments are unable to protect free speech, whether at universities or otherwise, then yes, indeed, we are in a very bad position. But my sense no, is... Let me, let me yes. 
Professor, let me just understand what you're saying. No matter who comes, no matter what disturbance, the university has to be prepared to handle it. It's the problem for the university. That's the argument you're making. You're making that the argument that a speaker that might fulminate a big problem if should never be refused. They ought to be able to come. Whatever the problem is, it ought to be handled. Um, uh, Senator, uh, mm. I, I'm always hesitant to say should never. There always are extraordinary circumstances. What if somebody's planted a bomb? Well, to me, the extraordinary yeah. circumstance is when people come in black uniforms and hit other people over the head. That's an extraordinary circumstance. Right, and that cannot be enough to justify suppression of those whom they came to try to suppress. Uh, that it's not just the university, it's the government. It's the job of the government. I'm not a big believer in large jobs for the government, but one important job of the government is to prevent violence and to prevent violence without suppressing uh, uh, free speech. So I do think that between the, uh, uh, let's say my own UCLA, between the UCP police you department... You don't think we learned a lesson at Kent State? Way back when? If, if I may, as the, as, the one, as the one person in this room who's actually had to make these kinds of decisions, Please. Um, we are in the business of educating at a university, but we don't have the resources of a, of a town, of a city at our disposal, either literally a budget to call upon or a city to turn to to say, you need to take this one over right now. So these are always judgment calls that are made. I think the way to start with this is with a strong presumption in favor of the speech, particularly if it's speech that's coming from a student group who's invited somebody. Uh, if an outside group wishes to come to campus, that's a different set of issues, certainly for a private university, to a certain extent even for a public university. Uh, but always then a judgment call to try to find a way to get to yes on a speech. Perhaps you even have to have it closed and have it available for closed circuit. There are a lot of ways in which the university can think about this. But the suggestion to universities, and it's not just public universities, private universities that are resource constrained as well, uh, that we have the resources to throw at all of these problems uh, is a vastly exaggerated notion of what universities can do. It's putting more at the university's doorstep. So I think if you start with the presumption in favor of finding a way to get to the program, and only if that can be overcome, then you don't have a program on campus. No matter how radical, offensive, biased, prejudiced, fascist, the program is, you should find a way to accommodate it. What, what I would say in response to that, Senator Feinstein, is that if we're talking about the substance of the program, not the, not the danger and credible threats, but the substance of the program, then yes, then I do think that, uh, that the program, uh, if, it's invite, if a student group invites, then they should be able to. However, I would say a flat rule of mine was if a speaker comes to campus, he or she better be prepared to answer questions. And what I would tell supporters, donors, alumni who would say, how can you have so-and-so speak on campus? I would say, trust my kids. Trust my kids to ask them hard questions, to ask them pointed questions. That's how we'll get to the truth. But here's the problem. It very often isn't your kids that are the problem. It's outsiders who come with a specific uh, program to disturb and hurt. Candidly. Well, then is a, you're, you're quite right. And then with a private university, you do have the option of saying this is an event that is closed to university students. Members of the university community are invited, and only members of the university community are invited. Our obligation is to educate. Public but university? Public university obviously has a much more significant problem there, and I would be deferential to the Chancellor of Berkeley or the President of the University of California to have to make a very tough judgment call, particularly in the cases that you were describing. Which, uh, well, I, I might say, are more real than I think a hopeful audience might think. And I think that's a problem. And I think particularly in view of the divisions within this nation at this time, which are extraordinary from my experience, I think we all have to protect the general welfare, too. And I appreciate free speech. You know, those of us that run for office, we run for office on the basis of being able to speak freely. But it's another thing to agitate. It's another thing to foment. And it's another thing to attack. 
I, I think in many of these speeches, and it is one of the things that a president would take into account, if a speaker is coming to campus for the purpose of, of, uh, of agitating uh, cases of speakers who post images of students on screens in order to intimidate or humiliate those students, that has no place on a university campus. That's not an intent to communicate. That's an intent to intimidate. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, the second vote has started. You, you may, I'm going to wait and go at the last uh, minute. I think I'll go at the last minute, too. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's not really my turn to ask questions again, but I'm the only one here. <laughs> I'm going to go back to Professor Volokh and uh, Mr. Abram again. Uh, many uh, higher education administrators say that they have to balance free speech with civility, respect, and diversity. Doesn't such balancing give the First Amendment, um, which is sets its own balance, insufficient weight? Um, uh, yes, uh, Senator. I think uh, when it's articulated as balancing, it seems to me that seems to suggest that we can balance away free speech rights. Uh, and while there are categorical exceptions, narrow historically recognized exceptions, I, generally speaking, the Supreme Court has rejected the approach that the First Amendment is about mere balancing. This having been said, I'm a deep believer in civility as an important means of promoting um, uh, 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 f uh, free speech, that it is actually that when people speak civilly, they're more likely to be enlightened and, uh, uh, and uh, to get all the benefits of free speech. I think that the university ought to promote civility not by suppressing speech that they view as uncivil, in part because it's so tempting. It's human nature for us to, to give the benefit of the doubt to people whom we agree with and say, oh, well, they're not really uncivil. They're just impassioned. Whereas people we disagree with, oh, they need to be suppressed uh, for lack of civility. So I think universities should promote civility, and they have ample tools to promote civility, but not by suppressing speech that they view as uncivil. Do you have anything to add? No, I agree. Then I'm going to go back to you, Professor. Your testimony described how earlier efforts to suppress free speech have led to today's censorship on campus of speech that no one then would have anticipated. If this trend continues, what kind of speech do you think would be next to be suppressed on campuses based on their content? Uh, yeah, I, I think that when people are concerned about a slippery slope, I think they are often quite justified. We live in a legal system that's built on precedent and analogy. And it's very easy for people to say, well, we accepted the restriction of this kind of speech. That speech is just very, very similar. Uh, and I think we've already seen this. We've seen uh, attempts to suppress serious scholarly debate. I mentioned uh, in my written remarks an incident at Cal State Northridge where there was a uh, award-winning scholar of uh, um, Middle Eastern history who had written a biography about the, uh, of Kemal Ataturk, the founder of modern Turkey. Armenian students were upset uh, with uh, the speaker because he was seen as too soft in Ataturk, who was seen as responsible in part for attacks on Armenians, uh, and that there were accusations that the speaker himself didn't take the proper view of uh, uh, the killings of Armenians during World War I, and they shouted him down. They kept this award-winning scholar from speaking on a subject that most of us wouldn't have sort of thought at first would be the one that's suppressed. Uh, when that happens, we've already seen attempts to suppress speech that's pro-Israel. There have been, a, there have been uh, um, uh, some uh, movements, even in UC, I think, to unduly suppress speech that's anti-Israel. A vast range of topics that bear in some measure on religion, on race, on sexual orientation uh, would be this way. And if we allow restriction on speech for fear of violence, people will learn that by threatening violence, they can effectively restrict it. And that's not going to be a tool that's going to be limited to just one side of the political spectrum. Yeah. Uh, M M Senator Kennedy, it would be your turn if you're ready. I'm ready. And also, could I ask a favor of you, because I haven't voted. Yes, sir. Would you, and, uh, would you be able to uh, uh, stay here and finish the meeting? I'm told that there's two other people who want to come back. Sure. Senator Sass. And Senator Klobuchar, would you finish it for me? Sure. So I can do some appointments. Can I have the gavel? <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes. You can, can I bang in the gavel? <laughs> yes. Uh, for, uh, since I'm going to turn it over to Senator Kennedy now, thank you all for participating. Uh, it's like Senator Durbin says, there seems to be a great deal of consensus, and I wish that consensus would be in the headlines of our papers 
when we read about the uh, violence and the uh, and the things that happen on campuses. And it isn't all violent, but people don't get to speak when they ought to have an opportunity to speak. Thank you very much, and thank you for participating. Senator Kennedy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Senator Feinstein, have you asked questions? Um, please, you go ahead. Okay. Don't worry about me. Thank you. All right. I don't even have to start the clock. M M Mr. Wood, um, T tell me again the speakers that you disagreed with but thought had a right to be heard in the interest of public discourse at, uh, at Williams. Yes, sir. So one speaker was Suzanne Banker, and she was a social critic. She was an anti-feminist, and she wrote a book called The Flip Side of Feminism. Okay. And so she, she disagreed with feminism. Exactly. Did, did she use offensive language, or did she just disagree with feminism? She disagreed with feminism, and she framed things in ways that were inflammatory. Inflam how, how do you mean inflammatory? By inflammatory, she said things like women do not belong in certain workplaces. They should be kept at home. They okay. should have certain responsibilities, things like that. Okay. And who was the uh, college president? Just a second. Adam Falk. Okay, is... Uh, is uh, President Fox still there? Yes, he is. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll share a couple of thoughts with you, and then I'll ask the panel to react, including, of course, Mr. Wood. Um, I've always wondered about people that did not test their assumptions against the arguments of their critics. Um... And that w it would seem to me that that would be the importance of that would be one of the qualifications of a college president. And it was suggested by one of the uh, our, our uh, distinguished panelists that that the problem is with the students, and I don't doubt that with some students. But students are, by their nature, are passionate, mostly liberal, center left. Uh, I certainly was when I was in college. Uh, and they don't have, they go to college to, to, uh, to gain the life experience and the learning that there are other points of view. So, with some exceptions, I don't really blame the students. They're, they're in college to learn otherwise. I blame the administration. I blame, I blame Dr. Falk. If, if he, because of his politics, or because he was concerned about offending faculty, or offending students, or offending alumni, or was worried about his security at the institution, and I don't know if any of those things are true, but if what the way you described is accurate, then he should resign. It's just that simple. B because he needs to explain to students and have them understand that they do not have a constitutional right in life not to be offended. They're going to be offended plenty of times in life. I'm not talking about hate speech, and I understand that hate speech is, is now supposedly illegal as a result of the opinion yesterday, but speech that's inflammatory, speech that uses a racial epithet, speech designed to provoke. I'm talking about somebody who wants to, to discuss a point of view that may not be popular. And um, I, I just, as far as I'm concerned, Dr. Falk ought to hide his head in a bag if he took a position like that, uh, where, where another point of view in a civil manner can't be considered on his campus. Here's, here's my question, as succinctly as you can, because I do want to respect the time. Where do you draw the line? Where do you draw the line? I don't want a speaker to come to a university and use a racial epithet repeatedly for someone uh, who, would, who, who would be offended by it, presumably everybody. I don't consider that to be adding to public discourse. But on the other hand, uh, if, if somebody wants to come and... Uh, 
and discuss, uh, as, as did uh, Charles Murray at Middlebury, or, uh, discuss the bell curve and is, is hooted down and denied the right to discuss an intellectual point of view, I, I don't see anything wrong with that, even though I may or may not agree with it. So who wants to tell me how to draw a bright line here? Yes. So I think personally that where the line needs to be drawn is when there is a threat made by if, if if the language that is being used in the expression of a particular viewpoint crosses the line of being a threat, that's when I think I also do think, though, personally, I try to consider intellectual value. So if I'm inviting a speaker, I think there has to be some intellectual value in bringing the speaker to campus, which is to say that I have to believe that this speaker is interested in contributing to public discourse in adding their opinion as a part of the conversation with a particular issue. From an intellectual point of view. From an intellectual point of view. Who else? Yes, sir. I would say there are two different questions here. Uh, I think... Mr. Wood has put it exactly right for what a student group would do well to use as the standard. Um, as a former university president, I would say my standard has to be, uh, ironically, somewhat lower than that, which is to say that would be my standard for somebody I, as the administration, would bring. But for somebody who a student group might bring, then the question is, is this going to be threatening to campus, in which case it could be uh, restricted, but otherwise, no. If a student group wants to put on an event, a student group can put on an event with one very powerful stipulation. Any speaker who comes to campus has to be prepared to stay and take questions and give respectful, decent, civil answers. Okay, I don't want to go over. I'm, I'm over my time. But, and I don't mean any disrespect to Dr. Falk, but my guess is that Dr. Falk, based on what I've read about him, is center-left, substantially center-left. And that he would welcome center left speakers, but he would not welcome center right speakers. And that's the most intellectually dishonest thing I've ever heard, if that's true. And I would feel the same way if he were center right and were excluding center left speakers. He's not fit to be a college president, as far as I'm concerned. Um, Senator Klobuchar. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you to all of you. Um, I think I'll start where, where we left off here um, with uh, Senator Kennedy. Uh, Mr. Lawrence, you were talking about how you balance this and what the standards should be. And um, uh, like you, I really value the First Amendment. Thank you, Mr. Abrams. My dad, maybe I wouldn't be here. My dad was a reporter his entire life. Uh, he's now 89 and blogs still from time to time. Um, so, Mr. Lawrence, you want to talk about that value of free speech and how important it is. And you were answering more in response to Mr. Wood. I appreciate it about those um, when it's appropriate to restrict speech, you want to go through that one more time just from your view, and then I'll ask a few others that question. Sure. I think we start with a presumption that free speech is protected on campus because it's absolutely central to the function of creating knowledge, discovering knowledge, and transmitting that knowledge through our teaching, our scholarship, and the discussions that take place on campus. So the lines are drawn only at the extreme edges. The extreme edges meaning that which threatens, that which actually would, would disable the learning process, not that which makes somebody uncomfortable. Look, part of the function of spending four years in an undergraduate institution is to be intellectually uncomfortable from time to time, mm -hmm. to have your ideas challenged. Yes. Uh, that's different. I agree. I went to University of Chicago Law School. So well, <laughs> then, uh, then, then nothing norm need be said. Um, the um, Chicago, I'm told, is the one place where it was said you could flunk lunch. <laughs> Thank you. I didn't do that, but thank you. Thank you. Okay. Actually, that's the faculty, not the students who could <laughs> flunk lunch. Um, so that uh, with, the, with those exceptions, speech will be protected. That's mm -hmm. the essence of the institution. Right. And this idea that Mr. Wood had just brought up, which I appreciate, the kind of the threat, uh, if someone has made a threat, which I'll get to you maybe, Mr. Cohen, do you, would you judge that by in the past or recently? How do you do that to figure out if it's a... As, as near as you can assess, what you're trying to do is to figure out what, what is the intent of the actor at this time. So if you have someone who is communicating views that are even unpleasant views, even I would say hateful views, 
If the intent is to communicate those views, then that is protected. If the intent is to threaten or to intimidate or to menace, then it's not. It's not always an easy line to draw, of course, uh, but those are the lines that we're drawing all the time in the criminal law and on campus. Those are the lines that administrators are trying to draw all the time. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Cohen, just talk a little bit about how you draw that line um, if you were in Mr. Lawrence's job and had to make this decision. Or I am glad I am not in Mr. Lawrence's <laughs> job or Dr. Oz's job yes. uh, because those are very difficult things. You know, the Supreme Court has uh, uh, written or ruled about what constitutes a true threat. Uh, and it's not merely how other people might perceive it. It is, as Professor Volokh and Mr. Lawrence have said, kind of the intent of the speaker. Uh, we've never advocated for restrictions on speech uh, in any context. Uh, and, you know, cases like Brandenburg, the in, you know, incitement of eminent lawless activity, I mean, it's very, very rare that one has seen something like that. So, you know, in general, I would agree with Dr. Lawrence, Mr. Lawrence, that we should uh, have a presumption in favor of speech, and as the Supreme Court has said, it's a bedrock principle uh, for uh, our country to engage in robust, uninhibited debate of good ideas and bad ideas. Very good. Mr. Abrams. I, I just add that, uh, I mean, we, we've all agreed, and it is the law that yep. pri private universities and colleges are not bound by the First Amendment. It would be constitutional for them to say... We only invite people that we think are of educational value. And therefore, we choose not to invite this person or that person who we consider not to have that ability to educate. Uh, the, the, I don't want to say the problem with that. The reality, though, is that so long as the private universities say, as they do, we choose to apply First Amendment standards. Mm -hmm. And so long as they allow students, as I think they should, to invite guests to offer their views on, on whatever, uh, that the university ought to stay out of the business of making quality or educational quality decisions. I mean, I think it would be inappropriate for a university to say, you want to have Ann Coulter come and speak here? You know, we just don't think she has anything to contribute. Well, the Republican students at Fordham, the Republican students in certain California universities wanted her to come and speak. And it seems to me that once you open that door, mm -hmm. which I think is well worth opening, then the university ought to stay out, except in the most extraordinary, I mean, literally violence on the lip of violence situations. Okay, and just could I ask one more question? Whoever is it's Kennedy. Yes. Okay, thank you. Absolutely. Ask as many as you want. Okay. Oh, well, wow, that's pretty good. Filibuster. Uh, oh, you're right. I'm sorry. Uh, thank you. Now, whose fault was ask, that, Ben? Whose fault was guys, that? Okay, this is freedom of the speech, but I just want to ask um, uh, one last thing since you're here, Mr. Abrams. Uh, we all know that you represented the New York Times in the landmark Pentagon Papers case. Uh, where the Supreme Court ruled that the federal government could not block the New York Times from publishing certain classified documents on the Vietnam War. Uh, based on your experience, can you speak to the importance of ensuring that the First Amendment and our laws uh, continue to protect journalists at this time in history? Briefly, if you could, no kidding aside, so <laughs> yeah, no. Senator okay. Sass, can I? All right. uh, no, I think that's a good idea. Uh, uh, no, it's, uh, it's, it's critical and... and uh, no less critical now than at any other time. Uh, I mean, we, 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 it is essential uh, that we continue to protect journalists in news gathering, in news reporting, in the expression of opinions uh, and the like. Criticism of them should also be wide open but, but uh, it is no time, there's never a time, but certainly not now, to limit those rights. Thank, Thank you. you. We had an incident in the Capitol where there was some closing down of uh, TV reporters, but we quickly fixed that. So I just thought it was a good question. Thank, Thank you. you. Senator Sass. Thanks, Senator Klobuchar. Thank you, Mr. Acting Chairman. Uh, so we are two minutes from adjourning, unfortunately, and I've been presiding over the Senate this morning, so have unfortunately missed this hearing, but it's an important topic. So I just want to first of all thank you all, all seven of you, for being here. 
We have Pew data that shows that 40% of Americans under age 35 uh, think that the First Amendment is potentially dangerous uh, if people can use their First Amendment freedoms to say things uh, that others find offensive. If we had time to unpack it, I'd love to understand, I'm a former college president, I'd love to understand the current state of play in university administrations where they're actually doing this very bizarre thing of trying to define the term offensive as if that's possibly adjudicable, uh, but we don't have the time to do that. So I'll, I'll close with just one question for Professor Volokh and for Mr. Abrams as well. Um, Given the number of legal precedents that establish free speech protections on public campuses, I'd be curious to just share a top line from each of you. Um, in the face of so many of these, in my view, bizarre uh, speech zones that are emerging on campus, I mean in the sense that there are so many spaces that are supposedly not free speech zones on campus, what roles do you think not just the federal government but state and local governments might conceivably have? I know it's a big problematic debate, um, but it is not the sort of thing on public university campuses that you'd think you need to think about governmental responsibilities to ensure First Amendment protections. But if we could get just a top-line comment from the uh, two of you. Uh, yes, Senator. Uh, th uh, that's absolutely right. Uh, uh, the state of Nebraska, for example, runs the University of Nebraska. And it has a responsibility to make sure that it's run properly. Obviously, much of the time one wants to uh, leave that to the professionals who are hired to run it. But it's off. But if it looks like they are not doing a good job of protecting student speech, uh, I think the state has a double obligation to make sure that its universities are complying with the U.S. Constitution as well as what we think, what I think, are best educational principles in protecting such speech. In California, for example, there is a special statute that provides extra protection for uh, 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 public university students, and I think that's been very helpful. I, I agree with that. I, I just add a note of caution that uh, I am uh, apprehensive about state legislatures getting too close to the university campuses in terms of d dictating or requiring certain types of teaching to be allowed, not allowed, subjects to be taught or not taught uh, or the like. Me but, too. But so, yeah, just just yeah. to agree with you, I mean, yeah. I, I'm a small government guy who wants to see as little of this adjudicated by coercion and power as possible, which is why it's all the more incumbent upon university administrators to actually go out and offer a full-throated defense of the First Amendment, not just in legal particularity, though that but also in terms of the spirit of a liberal arts education where one of the things that happens as you grow as an adult is that you actually encounter ideas you didn't already believe and you didn't already agree with. One of two things happens then. Sometimes you're persuaded. Sometimes you actually get converted. That's called education. That's growth. I think that's a bell telling me we're done. Uh, sometimes, though, you find that your ideas were good and were strong and were made stronger by having to encounter people who didn't already agree with you and you have to respect their view viewpoints and have a real debate. Uh, it is both uh, the essence and part and parcel of a First Amendment culture and the beating heart of American uh, belief in discourse. But it's also fundamentally what's supposed to be happening on our college campuses. I'm sad that we're out of time, but just thanks again to all of you for being here. Do you have the gavel, sir, or do we all a makeshift? We are adjourned. Thank you. Floyd, it was an honor to sit.